Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub. Tracing ancient migrations and shifting paradigms one stratigraphic layer at a time. Joining me as always as we pony up for a pint here in the Cross Time Pub, Jason Pintrail and James Waldo of Viking Lineage, I understand. How you fellas doing? Happy to be back on the mic with you fellas. I'm sitting here hanging out with... Uh my uh, corner of vices, as, as I call it here in my studio. It's a small mini fridge at the end of the desk that contains cold beer, maybe some other drinks on top, cigars, and uh, I'm just hanging out and enjoying life. Yeah, I have a different kind of a riff on a familiar Kiss favorite, Cold Gin Time again. <laughs> Although it's a little redundant, right? Two gins. Hey, I'm okay. Go ahead and pour three. There's three of us. Jason, how you doing, pal? Hey, uh, good. Uh, you know, I've been sitting in the house. It's uh, it's empty. My family has moved on to our next home to start preparing that for the big move. So last night I moved my amplifier for my guitar downstairs and moved the two guitars I have left here, a Telecaster and a Les Paul, downstairs so that they're right in front of me and that makes me play more often, right? So last night, you know, after seeing our friend Chris Moore's excellent Van Halen Panama video cover, I was inspired. So I moved all my gear downstairs and picked up the Les Paul and just plugged it in and started playing. And man, it was terrible. I was missing notes. I was all over the fretboard. At one point on the high E string, my finger actually just came off the fretboard completely. I'm like, what is going on here? I was dejected and all sad. And then this morning I got up and the Les Paul was calling my name. I grabbed it, plugged it in. And man, I was just on fire. And I'm just like, man, I haven't played this good in years. And it's just one of those things, man. Some days, as we all know, as being musicians, Micah, you probably don't experience this as much because you play a lot more often than we do. Um, but man, some days you're just off and some days you're on. But I was, I, I redeemed myself this morning. I was very proud of uh, what I was able to produce on the old Les Paul this morning. Muscle memory, my friend. You know, that's a kind of a thing that I think a lot of people take for granted when it comes to musicianship. Uh, the dexterity that one has as a musician it relies on muscles like anything. And just like a bodybuilder knows, if they take a layoff, sometimes actually allowing the body to rest helps them come back with full force. But there's always a little bit of that uphill kind of momentum having to work back into the game, getting the muscles ready for regular exercise. And with guitar, you'll sometimes see that if you're really rusty, but you do a couple of days of easy exercise, stretching, things like that, then you get back on and you are a six string samurai. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that actually does that. That's really true. And it really, it's kind of a cross discipline thing. And I'll, I'll tell you when I used to run competitively, uh, you know, I ran distance and it, this is over 40 running, but I still, you know, it wasn't too bad, but I, I would get so obsessed with it that if I started to have even a small injury, I never wanted to take any time off because I was afraid I would lose too much. Right. Right. So finally I'd gotten so injured that I just had to I just had to quit running for about a month and uh, I expected it to just be terrible when I came back and I was still in the military then. And we went out for a PT test, our physical fitness test, you know, push up, sit ups, two mile run. I went out and ran that run, man. I smoked everybody and I was super uh, uh, surprised, honestly. But from that, I learned something, you know, a little bit of wisdom. I was like, you know what, maybe Maybe sometimes it's good just to lay off and just kind of get healed up. That's know? true. Sometimes you got to have some downtime. And of course, it's been business as usual here during the current pandemic where I am in the bunker. And I have to remind myself sometimes to step outside, 
and smell the flowers. But you mentioned wisdom, James Waldo, and we're about to have a wisdom drop this week because our guest is, I think, truly a legend in the field of archaeology, ethnology, and anthropology in general. Dr. Tom Dillahay is our guest, and he is, I think, indeed, for me personally, a bucket list guest. You don't hear on many podcasts the hosts saying, this week we are joined by Tom Dillahay, and I consider ourselves very privileged to have been able to have this conversation with Dr. Dillahay that he was kind enough to join us and to jump on the mic with us and talk about his legendary work at Monte Verde in Chile and some of the other work that he has contributed to over the years. But he's been widely recognized as one of the most influential archaeologists of all time. And I couldn't imagine anything more humbling than sitting down and talking with him and he sharing his knowledge with us. So yes, indeed, a lot of wisdom this week on the podcast. We'll get to that in just a bit. I do want to remind you, of course, about our wonderful sponsors over at Occoquan Paleotechnics, LLC. Their website is O-C-C-Paleo, P-A-L-E-O dot com, Occoquan Paleotechnics. And we have truly been enjoying reviewing some of the fantastic stuff that Occoquan provides. Michael Frank joined us on the last episode, told us a little about what he does. But I got to tell you, I have learned so much about archaeology from studying the replicas that he has provided, which Jason, of course, has many of those. And it is truly one of the best ways to study some of the most important lithic specimens in existence, in my opinion. Yes, these casts are are absolutely imperative to being able to study these these rare artifacts. And uh, again, you know, hold them in your hand, something that's tangible that you can touch and study and share with others. So uh, I do believe that you know, it's a great product to have. And this week they have a brand new product, which is a Neolithic Flint ads. Now, if you're not familiar with the ads, it functions a little bit differently from an ax or a celt. Uh, this particular tool is hafted in a perpendicular angle to the handle instead of parallel, as you would expect with a traditional ax. Uh, what this does is creates a scooping motion with the arm. Uh, it's perfect for woodworking. Uh, the motion is also used uh, to scoop out objects such as bowls, dug out canoes, boats, things along those lines. Now, this new piece that they have uh, came from a private collection. And one of the first things that they noticed about it was it still had pitch adhered to the blade. So they're hoping to be able to test that pitch scientifically to determine the age and the composition. Uh, in the meantime, Michael Frank has created this cast as a study for the public. The artifact itself goes back to 2015. Uh, It was taken to the Smithsonian Museum and compared to other similar artifacts from northern Sahara. Uh, It matched well with other flint tools uh, from in and around Egypt. And uh, what's unique about this particular cast is it has a uh, front bit that's been chipped. uh, And that chip allows you to see the red color of the flint beneath the patination on the surface of the tool. So it makes it very unique in that way. Uh, It serves as an excellent example of that type of Neolithic Egyptian period tool. Uh, It's believed to date from around three to 5,000 years ago. And this brand new cast is available now at Aquaquam Paleotechnics. And don't forget, our listeners have a very generous 20% discount code. That code is 7AGES in all caps, the number 7, A-G-E-S. Enter that at checkout for a very, very generous 20% discount on your total purchase from Aquaquan Paleotechnics. That is really awesome. And thank you to Michael Frank for his support of our work. And we hope you guys will support his work as well. It's very important work that he is doing. Also, speaking of you guys out there, I've got an email I wanted to share here from Jim Gagney, who writes from Massachusetts. He says, hi, Micah. I always enjoy your podcasts about the deep past. I'd be interested in you and your cohort's take on this mystery. One of geology's great mysteries may actually be many smaller mysteries. That is, of course, the great unconformity, a big chunk of missing deep time. And he sends along an article from Atlas Obscura, which is a pretty cool website that features a lot of that kind of stuff. Best regards, Jim Gagney. And he says, lots of ancient stone chambers around here. We may have to come up there for a visit sometime, Jim. But James, I think this is very much in your wheelhouse when we talk about deep time and unconformities. Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks for sending that uh, article, Jim, because that's kind of a cool topic. Um, and I went and read the article and kind of, which is linked to the paper that's on the Academy of Sciences webpage. But anyway, back to the uh, the point of the great unconformity. Just in a nutshell, you know what we know about geology is uh, not from what's not there, but what 
is there, right? So geology is is um, sedimentation and rock and things that exist. So if if the rock's not there, we can't examine it. So in this case, um, there was a time in the Earth's uh, uh, ancient history where there was almost no deposition. It was all erosion. So if, you know, rocks from, uh, that were deposited in a certain time period get completely eroded, there's no way for us to go back in time and figure out, try to figure out what happened uh, and what was going on on the earth in those times. So, uh, there was this time where most of the earth was just in a erosional state. There was not much deposition, uh, and we don't know why. So I think that'd be a, a, a cool show topic and maybe we could get one of the authors of the paper on the show to kind of talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Again, more and more as time has gone on, archaeologists especially have employed geologists to help understand the dynamics of archaeological sites, changes that occur over time, and a number of other things. Again, it is fascinating to me to see the interdisciplinary nature of scientific inquiry, the way that so many different fields complement one another as we are unraveling questions about the ancient past. And that's certainly what took place at the site known as Monte Verde in Chile, where Tom Dillahay led excavations for a number of years. And I think it's more than fair to say that those were truly paradigm shifting in the way that they changed our conceptions about human migrations into the new world and when those occurred. And so as we sit down to talk with Professor Dillahay this week, we present this as part of what I think we're going to call the Legacy Series, looking at archaeologists who have done groundbreaking work and looking also in almost a retrospective fashion at their life and the importance, the significance that their work brought to our understanding of anthropology. I couldn't imagine anyone better to lead this series off with than Professor Dillahay. And again, you don't hear very often on podcasts that this week our guest is going to be Tom Dillahay. I think we are in a very unique situation, and we are very fortunate to have been able to have this conversation with him. Tom Dillahay has been an icon in the field of paleoanthropology for decades. And personally, he has been a true inspiration as far as my own interest in this subject. And so let's get right into it. We have a lot to discuss with the legendary Tom Dillahay on this Legacy Series edition of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Dillahay, Ph.D., is the Rebecca Webb Wilson University Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, Religion, and Culture, and Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Latin American Studies. He has carried out numerous archaeological and anthropological projects in Peru, Chile, Argentina, and other South American countries, and in the United States. His main interests are migration, the long-term transformative processes leading to political and economic change, and the interdisciplinary and historical methodologies designed for study of those processes. And I think I should also mention here at the outset that he is consultant to the Office of the President of the Republic of Chile and a standing member of the Commission of UNESCO to evaluate sites for nomination to World Heritage status. Only among the many accolades that Dr. Dillahay has behind his name and the great work that he has done, he's the author of a number of books, including the 2017 book Where the Land Meets the Sea, 14,000 Years of Human History in North Peru, and of course, a personal favorite of mine, The Settlement of the Americas. Dr. Tom Dillahay, welcome to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate you inviting me to participate in your, your series. Yes, these are interesting times. And uh, if there's one upshot of it, it is indeed that a lot of academics uh, are in a position where they can sit down and talk like this. It's rare that we have the opportunity to speak with someone with your experience, your career, uh, all the accolades that you have behind your name. So first of all, we, we again, thank you for your time. Uh, it means a lot for us to sit down and have this opportunity. Not only do we want to discuss uh, 
the importance and the details of the site of Monteverde here today, but we also want to talk about your career as a whole and, and the many stages that it's had and kind of get a feel for uh, not only your career, but where archaeology was and where you see it going in the future as well. And so to begin the conversation today, I want to go back to when you first arrived in Chile, um, when you were working on your field and dissertation work, how did you find yourself in Chile and what were you tasked with when you first arrived there? Well, that's a good question to start out with. Uh, actually, at the time I was uh, doing my doctoral work on Inca civilization in, in Peru. And I was at the U.S. Embassy in Lima waiting to speak to the cultural attache. And this was in 1974. Uh, I was a grad student. And there was a person from the Vatican uh, representing the Pope who was going through Latin America looking for people to establish programs, academic programs in social sciences or humanities in the Southern Cone, Paraguay, Uruguay, Chile, and Argentina, <clears throat> where simultaneously there were military dictatorships that exiled, uh, put in jail, or killed a number of social scientists. So as, as naive as I was at the time, and, and young and green, you know, the guy asked me if I'd be interested in going to Chile to open up departments of anthropology, beginning in the Catholic University, of course, attached to the Pope and the Vatican. I said yes. So in December of 74, I went to Chile and started working at the Catholic University, Santiago, to open up anthropology. And, and then after that, did it at another university, Universidad Austral de Chile. Uh, those were interesting years politically, socially, living under curfew, 10 o'clock to 6 in the morning. If you go out, you're shot, so forth. Uh, and also doing field work. But it was during that occasion when I was teaching at the Universidad Austral in Valdivia, Chile, that... Uh, some students came to me saying that they had found some large cow teeth and uh, showed them to me. And it turned out to be what I knew was it mastodon at the time, the term we use today, gomphotheor. And uh, I, uh, I went to investigate the site thinking it was just nothing but paleontology uh, setting. And it ended up having some stone tools, uh, burned bone, which kind of piqued my interest in the possibility of it being an archeological site. That was in 1976. And then you know the rest of the story. Yeah, it was quite a, uh, well, a history making story. I also have to ask you, uh, because we caught your wonderful Ted talk and we'll have that linked in the show notes for this episode, but um, they weren't maybe the most uh, friendly circumstances when you arrived there in Chile and you told a remarkable story about your first office when you arrived there. Could you share that with us? Yeah, well, at the time, you know, we're talking about the, the early to mid 70s at that time that when I went to Valdivia, uh, all of the rectors or chancellors of the universities were military personnel. So it was General Palacios was his name. And um, I had long hair and a beard which to the leftists, being a North American, they thought I was with the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> the military with the long hair and the beard thought that I was a leftist. So, you know, if you walk down the middle of the street or any side of the street, you were accused of one thing or the other. But um, I got along eventually with everybody. But anyway, I went to his office to start my career and open up anthropology at the Universidad Austral, and the general Palacios was there. And uh, he told me, you know, I, I've got your office ready for you. Um, and he didn't have much appreciation for the social sciences or the humanities. He says, follow me. So he picked up a, a cushion, a seat cushion, uh, in the chair he was in. And he, he says, let me take this along. We went to his personal bathroom. And he pulled down the toilet lid, put the cushion on it. And there was a fold-up table in the bathtub. It was a large bathroom. Uh, and he says, here's your office. And I'll let you know on occasion when I need to use the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, today, that toilet seat hangs up in the Department of Anthropology as the sort of symbol of its beginning uh, back in 1976. It's up on the wall 
And uh, that's an incident I've never forgotten, yes. <laughs> well, it's unforgettable by any account. I have to say, uh, Dr. Dudel, hey, that really speaks to not only uh, your own perseverance and character as an individual, but I mean, I think speaking more broadly, there are a lot of portions of the world that perhaps do not have the availability to resources and to scientists that will help study the history and the culture of these regions of the world. And of course, I think everyone has a right to be able to understand their history, their heritage, and learn what scientifically and otherwise their region has to offer. Uh, that portion of Chile did not have a lot of that at that time, and today it has a whole lot more, and that is almost directly uh, on account of your work there. So, you know, I'd like to just thank you for, in addition to the great archaeological work you do, the outreach and often the very difficult circumstances under which you had to persist in order to be able to make that happen. Uh, it's very much a lasting test and testament. I hope that that toilet seat stays on that wall forever. Maybe you could speak to that, though, also in the sense that uh, that was part of the mission. They may have thought you were a CIA agent, <laughs> you know, with the, quite literally. But in the broader scope of things, you're trying to bring anthropology to that part of the world and uh, to a group of people politically and otherwise may not have had access to that sort of scientific inquiry. What was that like for you? Well, I mean, you know, the, there was anthropology in the in the capital and a couple of other cities, but um, it the, the two things that come to my mind after you saying what you said, and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment on it, because a little later on, you know, one of the difficulties of excavating in Montevideo, the people just presume that you had all of the modern day tools that we had back then in other countries and other places. Chile at that time was probably a lower level, second level degree country. Today, it's probably lower level, first degree country. I mean, it's a fascinating place, wealthy as a country in Latin America. But back then, under the dictatorship, and excavating a wet site like Monte Verde, we had to get polyethylene glycol and, and uh, propanol alcohol and other chemicals to preserve the wood. Mm -hmm. That was really difficult. Uh, I had to personally go into Santiago and, and speak with the military and tell them we were not making bombs. Uh -huh. They would come out to the site, which was isolated at that time. We had to get to the site by uh, ox train, uh, pulling sleighs through the wetlands. And they would come in by helicopter and make sure we were not making bombs or hiding uh, tools and things. It was, a, it was a level of harassment. But fortunately, we were able to work with some – I had a Hungarian group of scholars who came and helped me with the conservation of the wood. But it was difficult back in the late 70s up to the mid-80s uh, and so forth during the major years of excavating a month of air, the logistically and to get equipment and everything else. You know, I kept inviting colleagues from different countries to come down and visit the excavation and look at the site, but nobody wanted to go to Chile, which was another difficulty under the Pinochet regime. So, you know, you know, we got beyond those things, and, and you just – I'm glad that I was young enough and green enough not to take everything too seriously because if I had it to do over the day and if I were 10 or 15 years older, I wouldn't have done any of that. Yeah. You know, Jason, before I turn it over to you here as well, I would like to point out about the wetlands that you're describing. That's one of the unique things about the Monte Verde site is, uh, to my understanding, the the prevalence of the moisture in the water may have helped to preserve certain elements in that environment, correct? Yeah, that's true. The, the site is on the bank of Chinchihuapi Creek, and at one point in time around Probably 14,500, 15,000 years ago, that Monte Bear, the two level we're talking about, the better preserved and better known. Right. Uh, a gallery peat bog developed in that basin during a dry period. And uh, the peat bog kind of kept the uh, oxygen out and preserved the organic material. Plus, there was a lot of silica in the sand. I've published on this with colleagues who have studied it that absorbed the acid in the peat and, and thus facilitated really the preservation of organics. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's one of the things I think is so vitally important about this site is not only uh, the dating, which we'll get into, but uh, the fact that organics were able to be uh, recovered in such vast amounts. I mean, as we all know, that's sort of the Holy grail of archeology. span It's very rare that you ever have an opportunity to find those type of things, especially dated back that far. 
So uh, I want to begin sort of with a description. We've kind of touched on that of the site as a whole, just for the listeners who may not be as familiar with the site. Uh, how big is it as far as actual size that's been excavated? And then uh, what are we looking at as far as the, the actual layout of the site uh, in, in relation to the terrain? Yeah, it uh, first we call it now the Monteberry Complex. I went back in 2013 as requested by UNESCO, who's in the process of naming it a World Heritage Site, to better define the horizontal and vertical dimensions. And in 2013, again in 15, and again just this past January, a couple of months ago, uh, we were excavating different portions of the site. So now it's Monteberry 1, which is a deeper component that may reliably date around 17, 18,000 years ago, wow. but that's still questionable. Mm -hmm. And there are some deeper materials that go back to 35,000 years ago that we cannot disprove or prove. It's just kind of hovering there. And uh, with greater techniques in the future, more excavation, maybe some of that will be revealed. Personally speaking, I just don't think that people were probably in the Americas that old, let's say 19, 20, 25, 30,000 years ago. But, you know, it could be wrong. Um, then there's Monte Verde II, this, this site that we're talking about mainly with all of the organics preserved by the uh, overlying peat bog. And that, that one dates around pretty reliably 14,500 years ago. But here recently, we have found about 600 meters away what's called Chinchiwapi 1, Chinchiwapi 2, which kind of matches Monteverde 1, Monteverde 2 along the creek. Uh, and Chinchiwapi 1 has a, a later Pleistocene period uh, component to it that overlies a deeper component that dates about the same time as Monte Verde II, 14,500 years ago. Um, and then even below that, deeper again, much like in Monte Verde I, you find stone tools, uh, what they call down there, braziers, uh, bra brasas, and uh, which are little small hearth eating areas. Um, and the preservation is not very good because it's up on a higher terrace away from that peat bog. So at Monte Verde 1, Chinchiwapi 1, and Chinchichop, Chinchiwapi 2, you just don't have organics very well preserved unless they're carbonized. So the total site area along the Chinchiwapi Creek is about six, 700 meters long, composing those four sites that we now call the, the Monte Verde Complex. Yeah, to be such a remarkably uh, well-defined site, uh, it is interesting to me also that we have one of the earliest prehistory sites in the Americas and one where we also have everything from footprints to possible post holes, you know, representations of cordage, uh, food sources, right down to the method and the shape in which some of the meat was being cut at that location, a tremendously diverse array of different information that normally is the most biodegradable variety. Maybe we can also talk a little about a, some of the variety of the archaeological evidence that was produced from Monteverdi II. Yeah, so let, let's, yeah, we'll just talk about Monteverdi II again due to the preservation. The site is made up of two, two areas, uh, what we call kind of a residential area that's reminiscent of the sorts of long tent-like structures that you see with the ethno ethnographic historical groups down in Patagonia that survived up until about 1880, and it's called the Toldo. And they would simply take timbers and lay them out in kind of a rectangular area and uh, stake them down and put poles there and then drape it with Wanako hides at that time. Uh, we found similar sorts of things and uh, a structure that was about 16, 17 meters long. Uh, with some foundation timbers that were staked into the ground. And these stakes are, tips are burned and cut. The heads are flattened, much like if you go out camping today and you get a wooden stake and you pound it with a hammer, the head's flattened. And these are tied to some of these foundational timbers with uh, Totora-like reeds with double uh, S slip knots. Same knots that the Wilichi people, the indigenous people who live down there today use. And when that wind blows, they tighten because they're slip knots. All of this was studied by Jim Adovacio, who was a very well-known 
basket recordage person who's worked all over the world. And and one of the things that at Multi Bear that I should insert is we had more than 55 specialists working with us over the years and still working with us, although a few have passed away. But Another assemblage, probably to me, the assemblage at Monte Verde that stands out more than anything is the wood, uh-huh. the stakes, the timbers, um, wood chips everywhere that are cut and burned. Some at the time you could take and conjoin to a timber that was shaved down. Um, once we put it, the, subjected all this wood to polyethylene glycol and processed it, these things became a little dried out, a little warped. But you, we've got film at the time showing conjoining pieces and so forth. Um, another, another, and we found a couple of wooden lances. One of the more curious ones was a lance about two meters long that was broken into three lengthy pieces. The tip, tip on that is burned and cut as well. And the three pieces were placed on top of a hearth uh, parallel to one another, and they could join and fit nicely. Um, in addition to the wood assemblage, there's the bone assemblage, which is made up uh, primarily 82% ribs, ribs of at least seven different uh, Mastodon individuals. And some of those have been split deliberately, the blunted edges, uh, on some of which we have found starch grains of potatoes. Uh, that's That section of the world has more than 350 different wild potatoes. And it's one of the staples of the diet down there, you know, past and present. And um, we have digging sticks, we, what we think they are made of, bone, uh, gouges, tusk gouges, so on and so forth. And then you get to the stone tool collection, which is both bifacial and unifacial. They were picking up naturally broken stones and enhancing their edges, but chipping them and retouching them. Uh, pebble tools and using them, what we call edge trim pebble tools. But there's also bifacial industry there uh, in the form of, we've now got four uh, projectile point fragments, kind of bi-pointed bi rhomboidal, similar to what was found up in Venezuela and Colombia called the El Hobo points mm -hmm. that date roughly around 14,000 years ago, maybe a little more as well, although they're not well dated. Uh, so you add all of that up in addition to features, such as you mentioned before, we've got three footprints. One's very clear with the toe marks. It's uh, left, right, left in a patch of clay. And unfortunately, when the person walked to that patch of clay and then passed through it, the mud or the sand did not preserve additional footprints, but at least they're preserved in that, that patch of clay that's about a, a little over a meter in length or so. Um, Heart, we got fire pits, hearths, they say post holes, but also just the stakes that were in the ground themselves. If you pull the stakes out, you got post holes as well. So it, it's chunks of meat. And one of the, the things that really impressed me with three of the chunks of meat, all of those chunks are kind of square like, sort of like a Wendy's hamburger patty, if you want to say. Mm -hmm. And they measured pretty much the same dimension between about 24 and 26 centimeters in size and square, extremely well preserved. Uh, those are in Maldahide down in Chile in the museum down there now. That suggested to me that people were sharing pieces of meat. But when you butcher an animal, too, it was suggesting there were units of measurement. I mean, it's amazing. I've never even seen or heard anything like that. But that's what it's kind of indirectly implying. Uh, until we've been able to see this, you know, when we're talking about the peopling of America and trying to envision what life would have been like, this site gives more insight to that than any other place that we know of but it's those type of details that i think paint the picture um, for anthropology and archaeology more than anything else that we could possibly hope for so just seeing something that is divvied up in a certain size in a certain shape and cut in a uniform fashion um, is there anything else in the site that is uh, that you can associate with the people in that same way to sort of paint a picture of their daily life yeah, I can. And uh, thanks for asking that, because the, the other part of the site, I, I mentioned the residential area, and curiously, about 30 to 35 meters away was a wishbone-shaped structure that was really interesting. Um, it had kind of a, a little entry area to it marked by burned wood, 
and it was let's say wishbone shaped structure and along the arms of it that the wooden stubs were still there that were preserved up to the upper level of the overlying peat but inside that structure we found three cuds masticated cuds you can actually see the molar prints on them where people were chewing it they were curved and kind of fit the upper cavity of the mouth as if you're sucking on something and pushing it up and those were made up of a sort of medicinal cocktail of boldo a plant even used today for intestinal problems like a tea herbal tea and four different species of seaweeds which at the time were 50 kilometers away to the west brought to the site um, and these four seaweeds have high iodine content these same species are used today by the local people and including chileans and, and indigenous peoples for pulmonary diseases and digestive problems so we think it was kind of like a medicinal hut and i've looked into the ethnography of hunter-gatherer groups and if you've got somebody sick living together obviously in kind of a tight settlement they usually build a hut that's several meters away and put that person there until they are cured. Uh, they sometimes do that with young ladies who are during their menstrual cycles as well, but sick people too. Yeah. The ethnographic side of all this, of course, which is very fundamental to your work, is, is very interesting, trying to understand their way of life, their culture. I did also want to ask about the apportionment of the meat. Uh, you referred to the residential area uh, and quite obviously, it would seem that due to the kinds of structures we see here, this, even if intermittent or temporary, uh, this was nonetheless a living site and they had stayed there for some time. Was there any indication of why the site would have been left or abandoned or what might account for why meat would have been left there and thus preserved? Yeah, um, we haven't talked about this too much because the evidence isn't that strong, but um we now have additional evidence from the other site there called Chinchihuapi I was talking about. First of all, let me speak to the meat. We, we did a lot of experimentation with horse meat and, and uh, itself, putting it out. And carnivorous insects would penetrate the meat. It, it usually took wasp about a week to get into it and drill into it, leaving their larva. Mm -hmm. um, Ants would get into it immediately, but not leaving much of a microstructural evidence the way a wasp would or some other critter. We had histologists who would cut sections of the meat up and look for this kind of evidence, and there was none, suggesting probably something happened at the site to preserve the meat within two, three, four day period. Well, since then, in looking at Chinchuapi and doing more geological work, we have found a one to about a four millimeter thick layer of ash covering the site and Chinchiwapi as well around that time period of 14,500, which we did not know back then when we were doing the major excavations at Monte Verde in the late seventies up to the mid eighties. But now additional geological work by a number of colleagues plus more archeological work reveals that there was a major eruption at that time period. Keeping in mind that from the side of Monte Verde, you can see three major active volcanoes that are, oh, 35, 40 kilometers away. It depends on the wind conditions. Uh, just three years ago, there was one that was advertised all over the world called Calbulco, mm -hmm. that winds were shifting from southwest to northeast and blew all the um, debris out of the volcano into Argentina, which is right next door. So we think that might have been one of the reasons there was an eruption and people abandoned the site and moved away. Um, we also estimate they were probably there for a year, but that it could well be that they had expended uh, their local resources to the point of cost benefit. How far do you want to go out in space to obtain additional resources, plant food, animal food, and bring it back? Why not just pick up and move somewhere else? So it might have been the timing between those two elements itself that, that caused the abandonment. I see. And based off the, the size of the site and everything that was found there, uh, is there, is it possible to have a population estimate of how many people may have been there at the time? Well, that long tent-like structure, if you look at comparable settings in the historical ethnography, it would house maybe 15 to 18, 20 people. 
But we found near the, that structure, about 10, 15 meters away, a portion of another structure. So I would estimate minimally 20, 25 people um, that might have been living there for a period of a year. And, and we say a year because of the intensity and, and spread of the trash. And we've got you know, more than 70 different edible plants there, nuts and berries uh, and other plants that ripen during all four seasons of the year. So we think people were there for at least a year. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Again, this site provides so much more information than we typically uh, get to experience. Now, as far as the uh, organic materials, the human hair, uh, fingernails, things of that nature, is any of that able to be DNA tested or has it been done to this point? We have worked with uh, Eski Willersleib, Pablo Savante at the Leipzig uh, Max Planck Institute with the dirty sort of habitational floor there um, and some of the artifacts and human DNA has been found, but it's either been contaminated by the artifacts touched by people over the years so much because when we excavated, nobody was thinking of genetics back then, you know? Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, but the, the, what's coming out of the habitation floor and what's coming out of some of the organic material is DNA that is so heavily fragmented that they cannot reconstruct it completely, but there have been human signatures uh, and they're working with additional material at present. Someday they, they can work with smaller, more fragmented portions and maybe get to what's needed to get a signature. Yeah. Now you mentioned, of course, the, the actual living floor. So I presume that with Max Planck, probably part of what's occurring here is environmental DNA studies looking for the remnants in the actual environment. Is that right? Yeah, because, you know, people's skin was exfoliating, mm -hmm. fingernails, maybe hair droppings. And over time, that is deteriorated in fragmented proteins and collagen, perhaps, in the floor itself. And one of the problems is down there, that's an area that gets 4,200 millimeters, 420 centimeters a year, a lot of rain. So it's not like being in a cave site where you've got an intact floor, but that floor, if it's got protein and collagen, has been washed out. You know, it's like taking a sponge and washing it and keep washing it. So there, there's fragments of protein and collagen in there as a result from these organic pieces from humans. What I'm trying to get the, uh, the geneticists to do now is the following. We've got a number of grinding stones there. Both of you have seen this on, on artifacts where there's polish from the use of fingers working it or holding it. We, we think it's polished from multiple use by the human hand. Is there, so my question was, is there a way to extract any protein out of that polish that was absorbed, which is the human oils, into that, those stones? They're working on that now, too. Oh, that's interesting because, you know, yeah. we, we look at blood protein analysis a lot. Uh, and our colleague, Dr. Christopher Moore, uh, has found some remarkable data with relation to, uh, you know, the prevalence, for instance, of bison antiquus. Uh, and other species in those analyses. And so in the coming years, there may even be new ones. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, when I was talking about the stone artifacts themselves, um, what is the material? Is it chert? Is it rhyolitic? I mean, what are we dealing with there? Yeah, let me go back then to the two technologies, the, um, mm -hmm. the unifacial edge trim pebbles. Most of those are local, meaning uh, from Chinchuapi Creek or distant areas of uh, the creek drains into the Maoyin River 10 kilometers away, and there's some big beach bars there. Rhyolite, tunnelite, andesite, basalt, um, and slate. Slate's coming from the coast, mainly makes up the edge trim pebble tool industry, the interfacial. The bifacial is made of a fine grained basalt um, and andesites that are not local. They appear to be coming from the Andean region and from volcanic zones there and even the other side of the, the Andes over in Argentina. But if you look at the total repertoire of resources in Montevideo, the organic and inorganic, it shows that people were exploiting resources 
edible, non-edible, everything, from the eastern slopes of the Andes in Argentina all the way out to the delta of the Maoyin River, which is a distance of about 80, 90 kilometers. That could be through direct procurement, just moving back and forth, or it could be exchange with other groups. We don't know. But um, so there, there's, there's some exotic raw material that was brought to the site. And curiously, it's almost completely associated with the bifacial tool industry. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think, it again, that helps paint a portrait of daily life at the site. And now something that you talked about during your TED, uh, TED Talk was uh, while there was no remains of humans found at Monteverde, there were some found in the surrounding areas. And based off of those bodies, you were able to uh, determine much about the stresses on the, the physical anatomy of the people. So could you speak to that a little bit about what was discovered based off of lifespan, based off of uh, damage to bones, things along those lines? Yeah, the, these are sites that are within a three, four hundred kilometer radius and date are, dating later in time, anywhere from 8,000 to nearly 10,000 years ago, uncalibrated dates. Um, and it, it shows that one, in terms of age, the adults are probably not living beyond 28, 35 years of age, male or female. Um, some were suffering from osteoporosis, mainly the females. Now, as you well know, there are, there are very few diseases that leave their physical signatures on the human skeleton. Uh, but it indicates some of these skeletons, and there aren't that many, maybe seven or eight that date to that time period for comparative purposes, suggest a pretty rough lifestyle. Some broken bones that were healed, which means probably people were somewhat limited in their mobility, I would think. Mainly that's associated with males as, as well, um, three or four different males. Then, then you see pits and other trauma on the bones suggestive of other kinds of diseases and so forth. So they were not completely healthy, let's say. And if you look at the modern day populations, again, t two of the, the illnesses that people consistently suffer from, it's the ecology of the area is comparable to, let's say, Vancouver down to Portland, a cool, wet rainforest, right. um, pulmonary diseases. And if, if you're dealing with a group of people that old who are becoming intimately familiar with the resources in multiple habitats, such as that area of the world, it's a trial and error situation. So I'm sure that they are eating plants and other things um, that sometimes make people pretty sick. You know, to Jason's point there and on the subject of biology, uh, there's something very compelling, actually, in a number of instances throughout your book, The Settlement of the Americas. And if I may quote you, you had written that there is some, though scant evidence from human skeleton and genetic comparisons, that regional populations were physically more different from one another than we once believed suggesting not only early cultural but biological diversity. Could we speak a little about that in the context of uh, the, the temporal relationship with Monteverde and its environment and, of course, the widespread dispersal, apparently, of human populations through South America at such an early age? Yeah, well, let me say, first of all, it's, got, it's pretty evident that who, the early people in South America had to have come from North America, mm -hmm. uh, dispel any myths of transoceanic contact and so forth. Sure. But the these when I wrote that book, that book's 20 years old, um, but it's still holding up today even more so, mm -hmm. showing a great deal of diversity genetically and, and uh, biologically in terms of the human skeletons, mainly the cra cranial characteristics of South America. And people believe there were probably two major uh, movements into the continent coming down the Pacific coast and are the spine of the Andes and also going around the other side to the Caribbean Atlantic side, uh, coming interior through a lot of rivers, Amazon being one into the interior. But, you know, the Amazon basin didn't, forest did not even exist back then. It was mainly parkland and savanna. So that was open territory. And there could have been multiple migrations moving throughout the continent. But going back to your specific issue or question, 
there's no doubt about it that both the cranial and genetic information coincide with the archaeological information of a lot more diversity, biological and cultural, than we previously thought. And that's been reinforced even more so in the last 10, 15 years due to genetic and more skeletal information. Uh huh. You know, one of the examples that you also mention in the book is the Lapa Vermelha uh, hominid, or actually Lapa Vermelha uh, number four, hominid one. Uh, you mentioned that toward the end of the book. What particularly uh, intrigues you about that uh, specimen? Well, it's it's out of uh, yeah Lagoa Santa area in in eastern Brazil, right? And uh, since then, they have dated that skeleton to about uncalibrated 10,800 years ago. So it's one of the oldest uh, in South America. And unfortunately, it's kind of in, in the skull and the cranial capacity and traits differ greatly from most of the modern native South Americans that you see today, again, pointing to diversity. But my God, you know, we're talking about 12, 13,000 year difference or people are geographically isolated and there's genetic drifts on and so forth. But um, th I find that skeleton kind of interesting and unique because it's the only early complete one we have to date in South America. Um, and uh, they call it Lucia. And uh, it uh, presents a, a series of different questions that did not fall in with the expected traditional set of information and questions that were being asked 30, 40 years ago. Right. Being that, again, it's such a unique uh, location, is there anything there that, I mean, obviously you, the organics and all of those things were very surprising and, and you were very fortunate to find those. Was there any one particular thing that you felt gave you the most insight into the earliest people, peopling of America from that site? Uh, whether it be food, whether it be organic remains, was there any one particular thing you can point to that you think uh, is vital to the story of the peopling of America from that site? Well, I think both lines of questions of the two of you have, have already touched on it for me. One would be um, beyond stones and bones mm -hmm. at most sites, you truly can find places where there's a preservation and a cleaner window of looking into the past. Um, one thing we have not talked about, and I'll come back to this later maybe, is the difficulties of getting colleagues to believe what was found. Right. The two other great wetland sites in all of the Americas is Ozette, up in northwestern part of the U.S., which dates late 13th, 14th century. The Wendover site in Florida, seven, 8,000 years ago. And when those were found, people doubted, colleagues, that such things can be found. And it's appalling that if, if you look to Europe, they're accustomed to wetland sites. <laughs> There's hundreds of them. But on this side of the world, we're not. I uh, just I toss that in, but get back to your question. So so one thing is the the amazing preservation of organics that just gives you a wide array of questions and insights into the living and lifestyle. Second is that once you do look at that wide array of information, one of the things that struck me over and over again, I kind of alluded to it a few minutes ago, is the intimate knowledge that people have of the wide array of resources available to them. We now have 13 species of seaweed at the site that people were exploiting as beachcombers walking the beaches out on the Pacific Ocean, 60 kilometers away at that time, are getting it through exchange. Uh, some are only edible and others are only medicinal. And these people were able to separate those things out into that sort of uh, pharmaceutical cocktail I was talking about in that cud. That indicates pretty intimate knowledge of things, but it must have been a lot of trial and error of eliminating things too, and maybe even some deaths involved. Yeah, um, th Those are the things that probably really strike me about our insight into the peopling issue. And, and methodologically speaking, I wish that sites like Ozette, Monteverde, uh, uh, Wendover and others would compel more colleagues to not only look for dry cave sites where you've got good preservation, but wetland sites too. Yeah. I, you know, you, you touch on something, Dr. Dillahay, that is so fundamentally important. And I don't think that there's anybody, maybe in the world of archaeology at least, who is more familiar with this than you. 
It is the way that, I guess, paradigms are very slow to change, even with sometimes very reliable evidence forthcoming. And this is one of the reasons that uh, institutes like the Smithsonian and others have regarded you and your work as some of the most influential in anthropology in modern times, because what we see at sites like Monteverde and others, there are corollaries now, but really it was pioneering work you were doing. You mentioned uh, James Adovasio earlier as well, and we've spoken with him, and he is another like yourself who was really on this this cutting edge looking at a shift in the way that we think about the peopling of the Americas, the temporality, you know, when this actually occurred, migration routes, uh, whether or not there were more than one migration wave, all of these questions, you obviously were met with some resistance. Uh, and yet again, this is something you had to kind of weather through, and you touched on that briefly. Maybe we can expand on that a little as well. What was that process like for you, seeing how in Europe these these are non-controversial discoveries, but if we say the same about the Americas, you're met with immediate skepticism and even, at times, you know, a combative attitude from your colleagues. Well, first of all, let me say a, a tiny group of colleagues still vehemently defend the Clovis First model. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's their life. And if you read Thomas Kuhn's book, you know, the, the, the structure of paradigmatic revolutions is so scientific. Uh, he talks about that, that the paradigm's never really broken until these old timers die, <laughs> sadly. Yeah. So, uh, but throughout the course of Monte Verde, uh, I got a lot of support and not a single element of doubt from Europeans. Yeah. And some came to Chile later on in 87, 88, 89, German colleagues and others. Um, or they call me up by phone to give encouragement, like Raymond Dart, the famous Raymond Dart, has now passed away, saying, look, all this stuff looks good to me. But North South American colleagues bought into it. They came and visited the site we were excavating. Maybe one or two had some doubts because they were trained in the U.S., but as Jim Adovasio, I'm sure, said, and some others, North American people, colleagues who adhered strongly to the Clovis Hurst paradigm, just gave us hell for about 20, 25 years. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Maybe yeah. the best. <laughs> I didn't graduate a single PhD student working with Monte Verde material. And I've now graduated over 40 PhD students in my career. I would not allow any of them get near Monte Verde because I, I knew at the time it would destroy their careers. Oh, wow. wow. And uh, so they all went off into other directions. You had to shoulder that burden on your own, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, that with colleagues and a, and a good glass of wine occasionally. That's right. Yeah, I would imagine so. <laughs> uh, I do want to go back to when the site was first dated. When those dates started coming back and you were looking at the material, did you know then what you were going to be faced with? And how did you prepare yourself for that? No, I, I didn't. And, uh, you know, people were saying, well, look, you know, you're working Inca. Why are you working this? But I, I grew up in the South Plains and worked in Texas and uh, Oklahoma and New Mexico and worked on Clovis and Folsom sites. It's not like I was new to it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but when the dates first came, I, I was really surprised. But geologists in the area, fortunately, that, that area of Chile – had been subjected to a lot of geological work by Europeans, North Americans, Chileans, and Argentines. They came and visited the site in 77 when we were excavating in 78. And one in particular, Calvin Heuser, the late Calvin Heuser, who's a well-known geologist from uh, out of the New York area. He told me, we've got that same stratigraphy that you've got in our geological sites of these gallery peat bogs underlying kind of a, a reddish uh, volcanic ash, which overlies the site and helped protect it. And I can tell you now, the dates are going to be 12,500 years ago because we got that layer dated. And your material should be a little older because they're underlying that peat layer. He hit right on it. The dates were coming back. Bone, 12,200, calibrated 14 plus, you know, and uh, burn wood and artifacts, the same. So I, I was, I didn't believe him, you know, at the time he ended up working with us on the project, but we were shocked and, and kept getting more dates and, in order to verify it. So, you know, 
Yeah, well, the, the whole entire process of everything that's gone on there is absolutely fascinating. Where does the site lie today? Um, is there any further excavation, anything else in the general region that's uh, being investigated at the time? Yeah, there, there, there are people. Uh, there's another wetland site that's got some good promise called El Gato uh, that's about 10 kilometers away. Uh, there's a site to the north about 125 kilometers called Pilauco, excavated by the project geologist with me, Mario Pino, mm -hmm. that possibly has footprints. Same setting. Peat overlying sand, and on top of that sand, one or two lithics that are good, maybe some bone artifacts, maybe some legitimate human footprints, all dating about 14,500. If, if it is a true archaeological site, it would be a kill site, not a habitation site. So those things are going on today. At Monte Verde specifically, we just finished about 10 months ago um, GPR work there and getting those results back now. And when I said I was at Monte Verde just two months ago doing some testing, we were testing some of those hot spots that were coming back from the initial results of GPR work we did last year. So I'm in the continuous process of um, defining the horizontal vertical dimensions of the entire complex for UNESCO and for the Chilean government too. So I'll keep you now over the next year or two doing a little more work there. Yeah. Before we wrap up also, I do want to talk with you, uh, Dr. Delahaye, about uh, the social and the cognitive aspect of what we're seeing and what actually is driving migrations, because this is a point that you've raised uh, numerous times over the years. Uh, questions about what drove the acceleration into uninhabited lands. Uh, generally, a trend that we would see in anthropological study is that when there is food in abundance and and people don't have to move around in order to obtain those resources, they tend to stay put. So what is cognitively, socially, uh, in terms of resources, what's driving the tremendous move required to bring people into the new world? Well, you know, as many colleagues have said it before me, one might be the curiosity element. You, you look out there and you see the next horizon. You kind of wonder what's there, you know? Uh, the second thing is you, you alluded to uh, maybe depletion of local resources, killed off the animals, uh, consumed shellfish bed or a berry or nut patch or something like that. And you just kind of gradually move on from one to area to the other. But on the other hand, it may well be, too, fission amongst groups where there was social conflict at times, and some groups just split off. Uh, but, you know, I'm not heavy into the model of gravitational pull where they walk over the Beringia and then all of a sudden they're pulled down to De Tierra del Fuego. I'm sure there was a lot of back migration, lateral migration, movement of different sorts. But... Um, I think that one of the easier ways, I'm not advocating this as the main primary route of movement into the Americas, but the coastline, any coastline, it you're, you kind of have a highway there and you're blocked off on one side or the other by the ocean and you can just keep continuously moving along that same area that you're pretty familiar with. Yeah, and that you know, speaking of that highway, that kind of leads to another topic that we discuss here often at Seven Ages is there does seem to be at times almost an aversion to the use of early watercraft. So, you know, what are your thoughts on on that as a primary means of moving up and down? I mean, it makes perfect sense to us, but yet uh, it it would be one of those organic type materials that would likely decay over time. Um, but just because we haven't necessarily found evidence of it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be the case. What are your thoughts on early watercraft? Well, I think it's very doable. You know, you, you tie together a bunch of logs, just a simple wrap to maybe move along the coastline with the coastline in view. Uh, I think transoceanic movement like Contiki or something is really kind of out of the question. Uh, you have to have fresh water, pretty sturdy boat. You have to have both a male and female to progenerate. Yeah. Uh, but I've been in touch with people who know wood technology pretty well, and they've looked at the Monte Verde wood where there are planks with squares, three by four, five by eight centimeters cut out of them, perfect squares. And they tend to think that that kind of wood manipulation 
is viable and doable for a raft or some kind of craft, sea craft, or coastline craft, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's very possible, yeah. And any similarities between those sorts of structures based on those you've spoken with, your, your own observations, any, any similarities between what we see in the New World and also in the Old World? Well, the, some of the bone technology at, at Monte Verde where there were some ribs deliberately split and they're 20, 30 meters apart and can join. Mm -hmm. um, people have, European colleagues have said, you know, this is something that we see 30,000 years ago in Europe, for instance, or in portions of Asia and so forth. Um, and the edge trim pebble tool tradition, people have tried to relate it to Japan, Korea, that area. Um, I, I haven't gotten into that um, because for South America, there, there was a time, as you probably well know, when some colleagues had postulated the Jamon culture of Japan coming over by boat and landing on the shores of Ecuador. Right. And it's a paradigm you kind of want to stay away from, at least if you're working in South America. I've got colleagues who are looking at shamanistic traits and beliefs and artistic designs in South America, active indigenous shamans, you know, mm -hmm. and they relate to similar sorts of traits amongst Siberian shamans that still exist today. It's a curious approach to take, one that I'm not really into and I don't really advocate that much, but it's a different venue of looking at the possibility of some cultural traits still surviving from the old world coming into the new world. In other words, the transmission of ideas and concepts perhaps through myth and symbol? Yeah, symbols, uh, certain practices, basic premises, uh, maybe associated with curing, uh, of looking at ways to artistically depict the cosmological world that's not well understood, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little more difficult to tie it down and study in the physical sense, like archaeology allows. Yeah, well, I think so often, you know, uh, a lot of people just look at the archaeology itself, and they they never go to the local indigenous people. And I know in your career, you've had the opportunity to do that on more than one occasion, and actually work with the indigenous people in that region and, and throughout South America. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, first of all, my question would be, relating back to the Monte Verde site and those early sites, are there any local oral traditions? Are there any stories from shaman or from other people in the community that uh, account for who those earliest people may have been, origin stories, if you will? Yeah, well, first of all, career-wise, I've done a lot of ethnography, ethnoarchaeology, to be more specific, excavating mounds with the Mapuche people, Wailiche, and, and the work in Peru. I've still done, I've carried out 45 straight years of research in both Peru and Chile every year. But the myths that the shamans have, called Machi, Machi, and they're all women, of uh, where the Mapuche come from, they point to the West. And then when I say the West to them, in their indigenous language. I said, you mean coming over the ocean? And they say, no. What it means is the shoreline, hmm. the coast. And that's what they're talking about, which is interesting because it kind of falls into what we were just talking about, yeah. a migration routes, you know? Right. Really yeah. interesting. It's all a, a matter of interpretation, though. You wait and somebody will hear that taken out of context and say, ah, there it is. You know, from the West. But that, that is fascinating to me that that seems to provide a corollary to the archaeological uh, evidence that's uh, been forthcoming now for decades. Uh, Jason, uh, also uh, brought to my attention in your TED Talk uh, a wonderful story that you tell about some of your time, uh, you and your colleagues, uh, and some of the cultural traditions and the differences in attitudes and very different perspective on the way of life uh, and the way that people in other cultures view us. Can we talk about that? Yeah, I, I was uh, in a, with an Amazonian group once doing a little short-term ethnoarchaeology. And a, a colleague of mine had mentioned to me that, you know, look, they're eating a lot of raw monkey meat and other things. You're going to get sick. So bring with you as many cans of tuna fish or something that you can. I did. Uh, so I had a my Swiss knife opening up the first night, the tuna can. And we were sleeping under uh, kind of a lean to with banana leaves over it to keep any mo moisture off of us. Mm -hmm. And there were about 17 of these individuals, um, breech cloth, animal breech cloth, you know, pretty, it's hot and humid. So they're, you know, barely clothed. But anyway, 
I opened it up and I had a plastic fork and I was eating the food. Mm -hmm. We woke up the next morning and the people quietly had left completely. So we were abandoned. We caught up with them two days later and uh, uh, my colleague who speaks their language, and I, I don't, asked them, I said, what happened? Why did you leave? And they said, well, because your colleague, because what the way they eat is the following. They'll take a banana leaf, kind of bend it, put water in it. You take a bite with your fingers. You clean your fingers again before you take the next bite, whether, whether it's raw meat, nuts or berries or whatever. They thought I was crude and primitive and they didn't want to be around me because I was not cleaning that fork off after each bite. It's funny <laughs> things reverse on you sometimes. <laughs> it is. It is. But again, you know, I think that's the importance of the ethnographic, you know, perspective on this, understanding different cultures, different traditions. Big picture here, Dr. Dillahay, uh, from studying what are among the earliest sites in the Americas and having such a unique ability to look into their way of life at a site like Monte Verde. Uh, what is the takeaway in terms of how similar or different that way of life and those people and their relationship with their environment is to how we are today? I mean, we are all people and we are talking about anatomically modern humans. What are the similarities and the differences and the big takeaway? Well, I, I guess, you know, one is that that I keep reminding myself in terms of similarities, they are humans. Uh, and those cuds that we found that were medicinal reminds me that these people get sick and they die. Uh, we don't know much about their mortuary practices at all. That's why we have a hard time finding the skeletons, which are rare for the late Pleistocene in the Americas. But also, you know, th there, there must have been feelings for other people and some sense of uh, sustainability by if indeed that is a medicinal hut, which was indeed separated because somebody was sick at Monte Verde, that indicates to me they have the same concerns and sensibilities that we have as living in today's world, which smacks of the, the, the world right now in social distancing and diseases, you know, very parallel. Uh, and some of the differences, I think, is uh, they, they must have, especially if you look at ethnography, appreciated the ecology and the environment and interacted with it in ways very different from us, obviously. Um, but one of the things, too, is that the living condition is that these individuals, I get the impression of Monty Berry, for instance, inside that long hut, the floor was pretty clean on the inside of the hut. And, and in a donut-like fashion, very dirty outside. So it indicates to me that much maybe like a New Yorker or somebody living in London or Paris, you spend most of your time out on the streets and not inside your home, uh, as these people were probably doing as well. So I think there's probably a lot of similarities uh, cognitively, culturally, socially, biologically, but a lot of differences too. Yeah. If you could convey one thing uh, to the modern anthropological community, especially students out there, with relation to having weathered the storm of seeing shifts in attitudes about our, uh, you know, conception of where people come from, how they arrived here, you know, what is your message to archaeologists, especially those up and coming who are exploring uh, ideas that are on the leading edge of new understanding like that? Well, one thing I would tell people is get a, a career and an education as interdisciplinary as you can do. Yeah, that's one thing that's changed, as you well know, a great deal. Yeah. Um, second is uh, make as many contacts with other colleagues as much as you can, too. But um, try and maintain some degree of an open mind and be humble about it. No, I wasn't always humble, and sometimes you just get downright mad at some colleagues <laughs> and let them know about it. And I don't have any regrets about that, but and looking back at it, I thought things could have been a little smoother throughout this paradigmatic ride than they could have been. But that depends on one's personality and character as well. But, but I think it's important to, uh, if somebody questions you and you think you have the, you're on the right track, move forward. Yeah, keep going. And don't don't always take no for an answer.
Again, another absolutely incredible interview. One that's been on the list since we first began Seven Ages. This was somebody that I knew we wanted to reach out to, that we wanted to have on the program. And to kick off this new legacy series, uh, again, there's nobody better uh, to get this series started. There's so much information there. Uh, We barely put a dent in it. So I encourage you all to go read up on this. There's some great uh, lectures from Dr. Dillahay online that you can see on YouTube and other sources. Uh, Take the time to dig on this a little bit more. Monteverde and much of his work is extremely important to the world of anthropology and the archaeology. Uh, It's certainly worth your time to look a little bit deeper on this subject. Yes, we always advise to dig deeper on this show. And in fact, I had been doing some digging. I can no longer, for some reason, find the article online. But Smithsonian Magazine at one time had an article online that listed the most influential archaeologists of all time. If memory serves, there were about seven of them. They had Tom Dillahay on that list, along with Sir Mortimer Wheeler and others. That, if anything, should fairly establish the kind of impact that Dr. Dillahay has had on anthropology. And to speak with a, again, I think it's fair to say, living legend like that is not only humbling for me, but it's also one of those experiences that every archaeologist or anthropologist or avocationalist like me aspires to want to have one day if you actually get to have that experience unless of course you actually enroll in classes at Vanderbilt and you're studying under Dr. Delahaye and so we kind of had a lesson uh in this retrospective conversation with him about his life and his work and he's still influential he's still doing the work he is still contributing to our knowledge of the ancient past so thank you to Dr. Tom Delahaye for sitting down with us this week and we hope that all of you out there enjoyed it please consider if you learn from this episode. And if you enjoyed this, share it on social media. Tell your friends about it. You know, get the word out about the good word of seven ages. We indeed appreciate all the help we get from you guys out there. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. And if you would like to email us, you can email any of the three co-hosts, Jason, James, or Micah at sevenages.org are the emails. We always love hearing from you guys. You can support our work as well right there at sevenages.org. There is a support the show. You can send along a donation in any amount if you so choose. But that, of course, helps to fund our own inquiry into the workings of the ancient mind and the accomplishments of people in the ancient world. So thank you to all of you guys out there who support our work. And fellas, that about wraps up another edition of the show. What have we got on tap in the weeks to come? Well, again, we're staying on top of uh, getting some very uh, important, big interviews. Um, We're going to have some uh, more variety in the uh, topics coming up in the coming months. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to be branching out a little bit further with what we do. And uh, as always, we're going to try to bring you the very best in the world of anthropology and archaeology. Yeah. And I hope as things begin to open up measured expectations, we all have to continue social distancing efforts and essentially just being cautious in this new world that we have woken up into. But I do hope, Jason, perhaps that you and I can leap into a vehicle, one that has been properly sanitized, of course, and we can head west to visit our geologist friend in Arkansas. So, fellas, thanks, as always, for jumping on the mic and grabbing a pint here in the Crosstime Pub. Thanks to all of you out there who support our work. You can find out more at sevenages.org. That wraps up this edition of the program. We hope to see you all again in the near future right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Mm -hmm.